We're good. Okay, so I just start talking. All right. Okay, so with that introduction, um, so with that introduction, first I'm gonna say, uh, uh, one of the questions that we're actually trying to answer when we're talking about which method in Hessenberg varieties are GKM. Um, so which tori are acting on Hessenberg varieties? That's one question. I've already sort of put nilpotent in parentheses there um, because, well, I, I guess because I am about to outline that, um, that uh, the question for semi-simple Hessenberg varieties is both sort of answered and also actually not as um, complicated in a certain sense. So like if we start with this question, which tori act, um, and then sort of kick the can down the road on the question of, is that action GKM? Uh, we uh, focused on subtori of the diagonal matrices uh, for the purposes of the rest of the talk. I'm going to put T with a bracket to just be my matrix um, and uh, keep this sort of convention of having the TIs uh, represent the variables. Um, and I'm gonna go back to what is the Hessenberg condition? Uh, so when I started, I sort of had this condition XVI is contained in the H of I. Uh, so then I also represented uh, my flag with a matrix uh, so, so then I said, like, oh, okay, this is the i column of this matrix, uh, and when I say that x times the i column of a matrix is contained in, well, I'm really saying the span of the first h of i columns of the matrix. Uh, so I'll say span of first h of i columns. I can write this as a matrix equation as long as I let H be this sort of uh, linear subspace of matrices where I have H of one free entries in the first column, H of two free entries in the second column, uh, H of three free entries in the third column, uh, and so on. So, Uh, so we can reframe the sort of uh, flag type defining characteristic, characteristic of Hessenberg conditions as a statement that um, this, uh, these uh, vectors, or in fact, this one particular matrix, XG, has to be contained in uh, a particular subspace of matrices. Um, and really, this is sort of like what we were doing uh, when we did an actual calculation of take a Schubert cell um, and uh, act on it by X and then start testing whether each, uh, each column in the image was in the span of uh, a first set of columns that you started with. Um, so uh, what we want is, so the, this first condition, XG in GH, so this means that somehow uh, G represents a flag in the Hessenberg variety. Um, and we want this to mean that if I take uh, the image of this flag under any action of the torus, uh, so this is sort of where the torus can send uh, G, um, so this should still be in the Hessenberg variety. Uh, so then uh, this final part of the equation is saying like it, T of G is also in the Hessenberg variety. And sort of getting back, uh, sort of getting back to Anders's question. Um, so if T and X commute, then, uh, then X, Tg is just Txg. Uh, so, so if this part, uh, so if that red part Xg is in G of H, then this whole thing is going to be 
N T T H, uh, which is what we want. Um, and in general, this is sort of uh, this is sort of like uh, suggesting that uh, we can start focusing on things like uh, what happens when you take your matrix X and you start conjugating uh, by uh, by by a torus element. Uh, sort of like a good place to start, let's say. Um, Uh, so if X starts diagonal, then it's going to commute with T all the time. Uh, so this is why we're going to sort of like eliminate the semi-simple uh, matrices, uh, the semi-simple X and the semi-simple Hessenberg varieties from our analysis, because actually people have already done that because, because there it is, the whole torus acts on it. And the GKM condition is sort of nicely hereditary uh, in many situations. So the fact that all of these things are sitting inside the flag variety um, means that, for instance, if you have a full torus action, then uh, and uh, on on a sub variety, then it will also inherit the GKM properties. Now, here's an example, sadly, uh, a, a situation where the full torus, so the full torus does not act on this matrix X, uh, where uh, where X is nilpotent, uh, it is like regular nilpotent. It's got these ones just above the diagonal. On the other hand, this particular matrix K, uh, the collection of matrices, uh, almost commutes with X. So just in the sense that I multiply it this way. Uh, so, uh, right, so multiplying on the left uh, is going to, uh, so multiplying on the left is going to scale the, uh, it's going to scale, it's going to act on the rows. Uh, multiplying on the right is going to act on the columns. The non zero entries are always in the i throw and i plus first column. Uh, so it's going to end up actually scaling this whole thing by uh, the parameter T inverse. So they don't commute, but they commute up to this constant, like the projectively commute. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so in fact, whenever you have a nilpotent that is strictly upper triangular, and it's non-zero only in rook positions, meaning a non-zero entry only in uh, a single row, like one entry of each row, one entry of each column. Um, then we can actually find uh, similarly uh, another torus that, that acts in this sort of almost commuting multiplies by a scalar fashion. Um, and then we can start like extending this same kind of analysis uh, to uh, to just a sort of more general set of matrices. So like if G satisfies the Hessenberg condition, so XG is in GH, then what about if we uh, if we act on X by some torus element? Is uh, does it does that same flag still satisfy uh, the Hessenberg condition? And really, in a sense, like what we did at the very beginning of the talk was uh, we looked at the column XG and then we compared it to the bunch of particular columns. So we'd sort of go, uh, so you can look at the first H of I columns here. Um, and just see whether their rank lines up uh, when you just look at the image X of the i column on the right-hand side, and you just sort of like move through all of the columns. And in fact, if we do the analysis that we were doing at the beginning, um, then uh, like we actually sort of like looked for pivots. Like when we when we look at a specific Schubert cell, uh, we looked at specific pivots, um, and we kind of like narrow down our analysis further to sort of say, uh, as long as the pivots 
in XGI or in certain locations, then the answer is like, yes, we can solve this equation. Um, if not, well, then as long as we have the ability to impose adequate conditions on the, um, on the entries of the Schubert cell, then we will still be able to satisfy this condition. Um, so really sort of partitioning the matrix into blocks and then analyzing conditions within each of those blocks. Um, and then what happens uh, when you add uh, this sort of condition here? Well, so changing, so uh, changing from X to something like T inverse XT, uh, will uh, rescale uh, some entries. So it won't change the pivot and non-pivot conditions, um, but it will start uh, moving around some of the other entries and possibly screwing up if there were uh, conditions on the, uh, on the entries, like we had an equation that looked like A equals C early on. Um, so if you start scaling those by different entries, that could get screwed up. So essentially, this is the kind of analysis that we do. What are the takeaways? Uh, there's an important interplay between what subtorus you pick and X. Um, and I guess I could also add to that. It also depends on uh, like the, the, the incorporating uh, what sort of conditions H imposes uh, adds to that interplay. Furthermore, concrete linear algebra analysis will allow us to identify many cases in which tori do or do not act on a given x. So uh, rather than specifically tell you uh, theorems, I'm going to give you the sort of spirit of the results that we have. So we have, for instance, if x is skeletal nilpotent, um, what are some conditions that guarantee that the Hessenberg variety admits an action of the torus. Um, so for instance, one kind of condition, h of one equals one, h of two equals n. Another kind of condition, h of one, and uh, so h of one equals n minus one, h of two equals n minus one, dot, 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 h of n minus one equals n minus one, and h of n equals n. Um, so these are actually pretty restrictive conditions. Uh, this is sort of what we expect on some level because uh, having a full torus action is hard to do. Um, so we sort of think that it should not be the case that a lot of nilpotent uh, Hessenberg varieties have a full torus action. Um, so we also sort of like fully characterized um, for some special uh, kinds of X when the Hessenberg variety has a T action. Um, and so in that case, like, we are set up and have some sort of preliminary work for thinking about the equivariant cohomology. Oh, and I think this is a uh, place to say, uh, this is sort of like uh, building on, uh, or the, like uh, this, so, so, so it might like, a, to address those in the room who wonder why uh, to think about just specific X, um, in addition to the fact that specific X uh, like the Peterson variety or the regular nilpotent X, um, or for that matter, the regular semi-simple X um, have a really richly developed theory. Uh, Abe and Crooks have an example. Uh, so Abe and Crooks analyze the particular nilpotent X where you just have a one in the top left corner and zero everywhere else. Um, and so we, we were sort of thinking a lot about uh, extending this, uh, extending that sort of block a little bit further and have some uh, very complete results uh, when the when you have a two by two block in the upper right. Um, so for this same matrix, in fact, uh, so we can not only tell you when the Hessenberg variety has that full torus action, um, in which case it's GKM there, but also tell you when this sort of almost commuting subtorus uh, endows it with a GKM action. So when it is GKM with respect to this uh, almost commuting subtorus, um, and I've sort of uh, give you given you a schematic of uh, the kinds of Hessenberg varieties that work. You sort of either you have your upper triangular matrices, um, and you can get 
just a teeny little bit more other than that sort of upper triangular matrix case of H of I equals I or Springer fiber. So those red blocks can sort of be shifted up and down on the diagonal, but you cannot add any more red blocks to those diagrams. And finally, uh, I think in the last two minutes or so, um, uh, so, so there's some interesting uh, implications of these connecting back to sort of Schubert varieties. Um, so one thing that we observed is that if Hessenberg variety admits a full torus action, um, then the way that it's going to intersect the Schubert cells is by imposing conditions, uh, imposing conditions just of the form certain entries are zero. So it, it does not need to contain uh, the entire Schubert cell, um, but it will not impose any super complicated conditions or even conditions like we saw before where A equals C. Um, and I'm also going to uh, add uh, results of um, I'm trying to alphabetize on the on the fly, uh, Laura and uh, Martha and John um, have some like also interesting results uh, describing when um, Hessenberg varieties are, are uh, Schubert varieties, um, which sort of connects to this idea of what, what exactly um, are the Hessenberg varieties intersecting Schubert cells in. Um, but we could further actually say that like not, like even if, your Hessenberg variety has a full torus action and intersects Schubert cells with these sort of like nice conditions, um, that does not actually mean that they are uh, unions of Schubert varieties. Um, so, so it really is a sort of like distinct uh, set of conditions sort of like related to uh, being a union of Schubert varieties, but different, truly different from. Um, and I think on that note, I'm, uh, going to stop. Thank you.